Welcome once more to the History Obscura Library. Today I'd like to share a rather modern tale, one that I believe might just tickle your fancy. And anyway, who doesn't love a good outer space story? That's what I thought. Once upon a time, in 1927, a boy named Gordon Cooper was born in Oklahoma. He was a particularly intelligent and ambitious boy who grew to follow studies at the University of Hawaii, University of Maryland, and the Air Force Institute of Technology. After his studies, Cooper was posted to the Flight Test Engineering Division at Edwards Air Force Base in 1956. There, he worked as a test pilot, flying the F-102A and F-106B. On February 2, 1959, Cooper was invited to attend a NASA briefing on Project Mercury, a project that would involve piloting spacecraft. Cooper went through the selection process alongside 109 other pilots, and was not only selected to take part in Project Mercury, but was the youngest of the seven pilots chosen. By the time Cooper joined the space program, he was already a firm believer in the existence of UFOs, having experienced his own brush with the unknown in 1951. The sighting occurred while Cooper was flying an F-86 Sabre jet over Western Germany. What he saw in the sky was a group of metallic, saucer-shaped discs that could outrun and outmaneuver any American fighter planes. On May the 3rd, 1957, when Cooper was at Edwards Air Force Base, he was managing the setup of a precision landing system on a dry lake bed. Part of the system included a camera that took photographs at one frame per second as an aircraft landed. Upon returning from their work at the site, the crew, made up of James Biddick and Jack Geddes, told Cooper that they had seen a strange-looking, saucer-like aircraft. The unidentified flying object apparently made no sound, either upon landing or takeoff. To Cooper, who knew his crew was very experienced in the field of experimental aircraft, it was noteworthy that Biddick and Geddes were so anxious about the incident. They told him that the saucer had hovered over them before landing some 50 yards away with the help of three extended landing gears. Cooper used a special telephone number at the Pentagon that was specifically used to report such events, and the voice on the other end of the line told him, Under no circumstances should he look at the photos or make himself any prints. Gordon Cooper looked anyway, and found high-quality photos of exactly what his crew had described. Contrary to what Cooper expected, there was no follow-up inquiry, and he never heard about the photos again. He later shared his UFO experiences with the United Nations during a speech in 1978. He told them, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets. Most astronauts are reluctant to discuss UFOs. I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them of different sizes, flying in fighter formation, generally from east to west over Europe. Though it has also been reported that Cooper witnessed a green, glowing UFO during his Mercury flight in 1963, the astronaut later denied such an event had ever occurred. Nevertheless, he continued to speak publicly about his UFO experiences while working as a test pilot, even mentioning them in his book, Leap of Faith, An Astronaut's Journey into the Unknown, which was published in 2000. 
In the book, Cooper shares his experiences with the Air Force and NASA, along with his belief in a UFO cover-up conspiracy. This is from the book. It's clear that our government started out in the 1940s trying to keep UFO information quiet because of our concern about public panic at the thought of vehicles from space being able to outperform our best aircraft by multitudes, which meant that we would have little defense in the case of interstellar war. That concern was expressed by none other than U.S. Army General Douglas MacArthur, who warned, in his last major address to Congress in 1955, that the people on Earth must unite to make a common front against attack by people from other planets. I give the public more credit than our government has at times. Most people want to know what's going on in the world around them, and would rather hear the truth, whatever it is, than a pack of lies. After the government told the first untruth about UFOs, it had to tell another to cover that one, then another, and another. It just snowballed. And right now, I'm convinced that a lot of very embarrassed government officials are sitting in Washington, trying to figure out a way to bring the truth out. They know it's got to come out one day, and I'm sure it will. America has a right to know. But as I see it, our government is now trapped in a big box of old lies. It's going to take a lot of courage on the part of some future administration to say, Folks, our government has been lying to you all these years. Now we're going to come clean and tell you the real truth. As I said, that's going to take courage something there doesn't seem to be a surplus of in Washington these days. Cooper assumed that the film his crew had obtained at the Edwards Air Force Base had been passed on to Project Blue Book, the official study of UFOs conducted by the U.S. Air Force starting in 1952. Once the project was declassified, however, he saw that his report had not even been included in the government's list of UFO sightings. He later learned that the crew members who had witnessed the UFO were told by authorities within the Air Force that the object they'd seen was a weather balloon, distorted by the effects of the desert atmosphere. A claim that clearly did not satisfy Cooper. The astronaut concluded that Project Blue Book had been more about placating the public than actually conducting any serious studies into UFOs. He said, Call Blue Book what you will, but while continuing to deny the existence of UFOs and eventually terminating its own investigation, the Air Force never attempted to offer any credible explanation for sightings of objects flying around our airspace whose flight characteristics seemed to preclude them from belonging to our military or any military on the face of the Earth. It was tough going for the astronaut, but soon he found a true friend. Here's how he describes that meeting. This wasn't the kind of guy you found on the next bar stool telling a tall tale about little green men from Mars, but he did have a fantastic story to tell about extraterrestrials. He related it in his unassuming manner, which suggested that he didn't particularly care if anyone believed him or not. Dan Fry and I had seen our first UFO within a few months of each other. On the evening of July 4th, 1950, Dan Fry encountered a UFO. From his work with aircraft and missiles, Dan knew that the craft before him was more advanced than anything in the U.S. arsenal. His first thought was that it might be some secret technology belonging to the Russians who he'd heard were ahead of us in the development of large rockets. But this wasn't a rocket. Whatever this vehicle might be, it had operated efficiently and effortlessly in violation of the law of gravity. The builders of this machine had found the answers to a number of questions that had eluded our best physicists. 
For that reason, Dan had a strong feeling that the object before him had not been built in the Soviet Union, or anywhere on Earth. The scientist in him took over, trying to figure out just how to handle the situation. He could return to the base and report the strange craft, but it would probably take an hour to walk back, find someone in authority, and return with witnesses. What if the object took off in the meantime? There would be nothing but a crumpled patch of brush left behind, and what could be learned from that? So, he approached the craft. It was about 30 feet in diameter at its widest point, which was about 7 feet above the ground. The object's vertical dimension was 15 to 16 feet. Its curvature was such that, from below, the craft could appear to be saucer-shaped when actually it was more like a soup bowl inverted over a saucer. Dan Fry claimed that he communicated mentally with an alien pilot located 900 miles above the surface of the Earth and that he was invited aboard for a ride in the ship he'd found. Inside the flying saucer, Fry told Cooper he flew over New York City and back to New Mexico in just 30 minutes. While communicating remotely with the alien pilot during the flight, Fry was educated about physics, the prehistory of Earth, and the ancient civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria. Cooper believed Fry's story so completely, as he later recounted it, that he enthusiastically accepted the latter's offer of a flying saucer trip of his own. Cooper packed a bag and a camera and waited for Fry's telephone call to confirm the rendezvous point. The hours ticked by, but that call didn't come, much to Cooper's disappointment. Fry explained later that the missed appointment was due to some last-minute political disagreements on the home planet of his alien contact. The former astronaut was reportedly very saddened at the knowledge that he would not be returning to outer space. Oh, missed connections make up the saddest stories, don't you think? That's all for tonight, friends. Good night.